Healthcare is a complex business. Oscar is a company that wanted to build a new insurance provider, but they realized that healthcare is so interconnected that in order to build a new insurance provider, they actually needed to build an entire healthcare business too, complete with patient management and facilities. Since Oscar is a modern technology company, they focus on customer service and engineering and data management, and this company offers an optimistic view into what healthcare might look like in the near future. Every time a patient interacts with the healthcare system, their insurance provider has an opportunity to collect data on that interaction. Isaac Council helped architect the infrastructure at Oscar that manages and analyzes this patient data. In this episode, we talk about the healthcare system, the data engineering of Oscar, and Apache Mesos, which Oscar uses to manage its applications. We have an interesting discussion of Apache Mesos versus Kubernetes, and I hope to do more shows about the evolving healthcare technology space. It's really intriguing me right now. Artificial intelligence is dramatically evolving the way that our world works. And to make AI easier and faster, we need new kinds of hardware and software, which is why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems and its platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop a full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for an opening on the team. To learn more about the company, check out the interviews that I've conducted with its engineers. Those are also available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel. Come build the future with Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply now. Isaac Council is the VP of Engineering at Oscar. Isaac, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks. It's great to be here. I want to begin by discussing health insurance and why this is a technology problem. And then we will work our way towards the actual engineering. So let's start with a naive question. What is health insurance? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's absolutely not just a technology problem. And technology is, we, we think, part of the, the solution here. But health insurance is really it's an interesting entity that is a, a really crucial player in in, in healthcare. Uh, so, like just uh, just thinking about what we are as a health insurance company, I, I think I have to discuss a little bit about the Affordable Care Act and how that sort of changed the setting. It's really a bit about why we're here, and so you can look at health insurance as being. Traditionally in America, it's been a, a product that is sold um, mostly to, to employers in order to cover the insurance needs, the, the medical costs of, of the employees of a company. You know, that's been a traditional model in, in America, and you know, companies get, get uh, tax write-offs. They're incentivized to, to provide these benefits and, in fact, legally responsible for, for providing these benefits. And now... Now that insurer is responsible for you know, taking claims from the, the medical care that is encouraged by, by the employees of, of these companies and paying according to usually negotiated fee schedules with the, the doctor networks, uh, the doctors, the hospitals, or the pharmacies in the, in the case of, of drugs. And so we're, we're, we're the, the payer, typically. So when, you, when you hear the word uh, single payer, you know, which has been a, a, a buzzword, that's, that's been going on well for the for the last year. You heard a lot in the election cycle. You know, that right now, we're, we're we're one of the multiple payers because there's multiple insurance companies. We're all competing uh, with each other to get the best uh, rates with the with the providers, and so we're the payer in the system. You know, we have a relationship with uh, traditionally health insurers will have the relationship with an employer, and so they'll, they'll have the secondary relationship with the employees, the, the, the people who actually are like generating the bills, and they'll also have that secondary relationship with, with the, the providers because they're the ones who, who, get, who get paid. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Mm. 
Hmm. Now, the, like I, I, I should go on to, to talk about how that relationship has changed under the Affordable Care Act, where you know, the Affordable Care Act is really shaking things up so that so we're still the payer, but the relationships are entirely different. Now, right, because of the individual markets, for the first time, you, you have you know, broad swaths of uh, public who are able to engage directly with the insurers. And so now, uh, we've, we've gone, like the, the industry has gone through to selling basically enterprise insurance to, to enterprise. And now we're selling consumer product almost. We're selling product directly to customers. Mm-hmm. And so that really changes things in a, in a very, very fundamental way. And that's where technology starts to, to creep in in a, in a very obvious way, because now we can talk about uh, technology as the, the industry is currently thinking about uh, mobile applications, uh, desktop applications, portals for, for actual uh, member, member experience, mm-hmm. which was a, a secondary, really a secondary concern uh, before. I mean, we really benefit from having that deep relationship with, with members, which wasn't necessarily the case before. I mean, it, it used to be the case, remember, that uh, uh, the, the employers were the ones who uh, we want to uh, be, be cozy with because they were, they were actually paying us. And the, the people who were engaging with healthcare, well, they, they cost us every time we, we interact with them. Now it's completely changed with, uh, with Oscar, with all the other uh, insurers on these individual markets. We're engaging directly with the members of the ones who are paying us, and they are also the ones who are uh, receiving the, the benefit from our from our service. If mm. we don't provide them a great benefit, well, they can uh, they can just go and find another insurer, which really should be the way that it works after all. So, so you discussed this difference between the model where I get health insurance through my workplace where my insurance is tightly coupled to my workplace versus the idea of health insurance being provided or being purchased by me. And I, I'm not precisely sure how Oscar works. I, I guess I, I didn't quite understand that aspect of your, of your explanation. So, you know, all the companies that I've worked at in the past, I've gotten health insurance through the company and it's set me up with this tight coupling to the company where it might be hard to, if I switch jobs, then I might not get to keep my doctor. And it raises the question, why is this healthcare plan even being provided by my employer? And since then, since leaving the workplace and becoming employed by my own company, now I get individual health insurance that I purchase outside of the, com- outside of the company that I worked for. The health insurance quality is probably not as good but at least I am completely in control of it. Can you contrast those two models a little bit more and explain what Oscar does relative to those models? Sure. Well, I, I, I don't understand why it wouldn't have to be as good. Hopefully it would be at least as good. But it's the model being fundamentally different, I think, is, is, is really the key. Uh, first off, like with, your, with your employers, I mean, have you, have you ever gotten to choose uh, which, which company you want to be insured with, uh, which doctors, doctors network, that sort of thing? It's fairly unusual. I don't uh, remember. Yeah, you, oftentimes you get to choose the the plan, you know, the EPO, the PPO, all that, yes. all that stuff. But you don't necessarily fundamentally get a choice between Aetna or Cigna or yeah, you know, the all the all the other various options that are out there. Uh, because all of that uh, negotiation, all that choice was was done by the by the employer, and so like the the employers had. Is is basically trying to get the best policy that they can for the maximum, the 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 best considering the population of of employees, and that's not necessarily done with you individually in mind. Uh, they're trying to they're trying to do the best they can on the budget that they have, but maybe there's a a better product for you. Maybe you're interested in something a different offering that some other company or some other plan provides, and that's been the the that market force which has been just absolutely absent, and so. So really, that like opening up that that individual choice is actually normalizing the insurance market, or at least that's the that's the hope, that's the promise. It's normalizing that insurance market to be a, a fair and free market in in a much in a much broader notion than what it has been before. You have individuals making the choice for them for for themselves, rather than that choice being made on their behalves by the employers. When a company sells you health insurance. So when I buy health insurance from a company, they are making a bet on how my health is relative to the 
price of care that I may need to receive if I have a health incident. Can you explain how a health insurance company calculates the expected value of that bet and how they price insurance for a given customer? Sure. Well, well. first off, you know, we don't price uh, for for individual customers under the Affordable Care Act. That's actually one of the, the really nice things um, that's under under heat right now. Now you uh, might have seen if you're following the what's what's happening in, in in D.C. right now. There's a lot of exciting talk about removing some of those provisions uh, from the from the Affordable Care Act. But right now, our, our plans have a fixed price, and the, that fixed price is is for is for everybody who wants to, to choose those. Those, those plans we don't we don't price you up based on some pre-existing condition some pre-existing set uh, of, of, of factors that's one of the things that the Affordable Care Act has, has actually removed and so yeah it, it, getting back to that like, in general I mean I've, I've talked about the the Affordable Care Act really changing the nature of the of, of the relationships um, and in this industry, and also like this, uh, removing uh, individual pricing based on pre-existing conditions. Yeah, those are really wonderful things that the Affordable Care Act has done. And there's, there's, I don't think anybody you'll find anybody who's who's really studied the Affordable Care Act that that doesn't come to the conclusion that it is a, it has some some significant flaws, uh, some some places where it could benefit from improvement. But it's it's fundamentally changed the expectations around insurance, and that's really what one of the things that we're here trying to fully realize to to help realize the, those those visions. And so, getting back to your question, we're basically we price based on based on actuarial risk. Uh, it's uh, the same as as any other any other insurance. Get auto insurance, then yeah, there's a there, there's a lot of actuarial tables that are, can be used to, to calculate what the the likelihood, uh, what, what's the the statistical probability of, of getting in a crash, and what's the the distribution of expenses for for those uh, for those crashes. I mean, it's really a, a statistical problem, and the the same the same goes for for health insurance. What's the statistical likelihood that you know you're going to be you're going to need care? And what is that care going to cost? The distribution of costs it can go anywhere from just a, a routine checkup to uh, being diagnosed with a with, with some kind of horrible cancer, uh, which which could be which would be very costly. And you know, we have to keep in in mind all the probabilities and the cost distribution. And we at, at the end of the day, you, know, you have to you have to be taking in more money than you pay out in terms of the, the medical expenses for your your membership base and that's one of the that's that's basically the key metric uh, for for us as an insurance company it's called the medical loss ratio the, the medical loss ratio is basically what are we paying out to providers and you know, to, to pharmacies uh, medical spend uh, versus what we're taking in in revenue and and the idea is to have that medical loss ratio be around 85%, uh, something like that. Is uh, cons- like anything under 90 is considered very, very healthy. Uh, we have to fit all of our operations, uh, all of our operational expenses, in the the area of the the MLR, like up to up to one, and. And that's basically what we have to keep in mind with the with the pricing. We have to predict the overall medical expenses for for the membership, and we're trying to hit that that target as precisely as we can. That you know, our our medical spend is going to be right around that those those numbers, like mm. yeah, somewhere in the eighty to ninety range is, is what we're what we're hoping for. Mm. You could build a health insurance business that is better than the existing competitors by just building a better. UX because I, I've interacted with my own health insurance provider's website and it's really frustrating experience. I wish I could just pay ten dollars more a month to have a better UI. And so I haven't purchased through Oscar, but just from browsing the website and clicking through things, I can understand that the UX of the product is much better. So let's start to talk about the engineering. Describe the basic architecture of the user-facing application. If I'm a user who wants to buy health insurance through Oscar, what is the application that I'm dealing with? Sure, and uh, just uh, I've got to say, I'm really happy to hear what you're what you're what you're saying now that uh, that the UX is is such an important consideration. It's it's really it's it's a particularly entertaining thing because that was one of the one of the things that we heard a lot when we were just getting started around 2013, early 2014, from uh, from these other insurance companies that 
or, or from other like, academics in the field say, like, wow, you know, Oscar, that's really cute. But what they don't realize is that nobody in this industry cares about the, uh, cares about the website. They're talking about uh, single digit engagement to, to websites of insurers uh, out there. And, that it's, and they, they'll get excited about maybe five or six. And you know, we saw early on that uh, providing a really nice experience and really providing some, some very valuable functionality drove an engagement order of magnitude more than, than what folks were, were telling us we could expect in the best case. We started seeing numbers like you know, 70% engagement uh, month over month. And you know, so that's, I, I think uh, what you said really bears out. And to get back to your question about the mm-hmm. about what the, the tech stack actually is, well, recently we've we've gone really all in with React. Like we just absolutely love React. When we moved over to it, um, you just see the the unit test coverage skyrocket in the the code base, which uh, makes me super happy. It's also just enabled just a, a, a ton of really interesting stuff, uh, which we can talk about if you're if you're interested. But uh, in the JavaScript layer, typically. Uh, all the new stuff that we're we're moving to is in React. There might be some some legacy that isn't there, but yeah, that's uh, it's, uh, not it's, it's it's going away, and it's it's on a Flask application. And the Flask application is 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 being launched. Well, it depends on which uh, which product you're talking about, but in in general, we launch all of our applications um, inside of Mesos, and so we we have a, a particular zone in our our Mesos cluster, which is for user-facing applications. Uh, we're typically launching into that. Uh, these uh, Flask applications that are serving out um, serving out React clients, and we're using HA proxy to to route these things. So that's yeah, in a in a nutshell, that's that's kind of what's going on. We're using AWS right now. If that's uh, if that's of, of, of any interest, <laughs> yeah. But the, I, I also want to emphasize that like this this thing that you see the the website and like what uh, what a member is actually going to engage with is really just absolutely the tip of the iceberg uh, when it comes to engineering at, at Oscar. We're doing a lot of exciting stuff on the the front end for for members, and I think we have a, a very exciting program uh, going going forward. Uh, but we also have a, a ton of application development for internal use cases for our, our member service. Uh, representatives, for example, or internal operations. And then we, we have hundreds of applications that are just <laughs> moving data around, collecting data from, from the outside. It's, it's actually a, a wonderfully complex space. And uh, that, 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 that member website really is just the tip, what you, what you can see. Your application sits on layers of dynamic infrastructure and supporting services. Datadog brings you visibility into every part of your infrastructure, plus APM for monitoring your application's performance. Dashboarding, collaboration tools, and alerts let you develop your own workflow for observability and incident response. Datadog integrates seamlessly with all of your apps and systems, from Slack to Amazon Web Services, so you can get visibility in minutes. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to get started with Datadog and get a free t-shirt. With full observability, distributed tracing, and customizable visualizations, Datadog is loved and trusted by thousands of enterprises, including Salesforce, PagerDuty, and Zendesk. If you haven't tried Datadog at your company or on your side project, Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to support Software Engineering Daily and get a free t-shirt. Our deepest thanks to Datadog for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It is only with the help of sponsors like you that this show is successful. So thanks again. Of course, I want to get into the customer service backend applications as well as the data engineering sure. applications. But let's talk real quick about Mesos and your infrastructure orchestration layer. So you said you're launching these Flask applications on Mesos. Are these being launched on VMs or in containers? 
Well, in, in VMs right now, so the, the containerization thing is, is kind of a fun topic. We've been avoiding Docker and a lot of the containerization out there for uh, for a few years now, mostly because I, I think a lot of us just didn't feel like it was quite ready for, for prime time. I mean, the, even the, the Docker 1.0 release was uh, you know, built on, on dot releases of, of some substantial underlying parts. And it's been really exciting to, to watch it, but we've really sat back uh, for that. We're starting to, to go with containers now. I think that like, the, the space has matured quite a bit. So we've got a lot of reliability going on. You see other options going on with uh, like using Docker images in other ways, like uh, the Mesos containerizer, for, for example, is something that, that I'm very excited about. Where we can get the benefits from from containers, but without necessarily extra extra services and extra complexity going on. Uh, we're going to be using Docker, but basically, what we decided really early on is we're going to keep it as absolutely simple as possible, and we're going to be disciplined as as developers. So, I mean, a lot of us were at, at Google before. I was at Google before. It was helpful to be to be kind of brainwashed in the in the same space. And at Google, the what the the mantra is sort of. Yeah, you know, single statically linked binary is is really the the, the key to beautiful deployments. Because yeah, the, the you build you you make sure that your image is common. Your your build your build is is done on a machine that uh, that mimics the production environment. And when it gets time to deploy, you just download a thing and you dot slash run it. And it's it's great. And and then yeah, you know, we have with with Mesos we get uh, nice things like C groups. Uh, we can uh, allocate uh, just the the right amount of of RAM, CPU, and disk, and you know, hold your process to that, and so that that means that we, we basically have all the containerization that, that we need. That we have, you know, we we have our uh, resource isolation, we have our artifact isolation, and yeah, we, we get the benefit of of like straight up Unix security that way. It's very very simple. But the, the only time that we really get into trouble is you know, when we need something weird, like uh, somebody you know, wants to like, use the you know, LibreOffice IPDF rendering em, uh, engine just to pick on a, a recent case. And uh, then it's, yeah, it's kind of annoying to build a, a few like, Mesos nodes that, that, have just, uh, that, that have this special stuff on them so that we can use the, the shared libraries. Yeah, the container would, would be lovely for that, to, to be able just to load up a, a Docker image with, with LibreOffice office and just go to town uh, but but really you know discipline first and uh, you know, mesos really i think helped us develop some very very good habits early on the reason that i've heard people move from virtualization to containerization at least one of the reasons is that when you go to containers you can break up the vms into units that are more properly sized to the jobs that you are allocating to those units. So if you do everything in terms of VMs, a VM has a floor to how small you can make it. And a lot of times you're going to spin up a VM, you're going to use it for some kind of application, and that application is not going to take advantage, take full advantage of the resources available in that VM. Whereas if you slice it up into containers, the containers can fit more exactly to the size of the job so is the uh, that makes sense but i it's uh, I, uh mesos really is uh, is the, the way we get around that now uh, because mm. uh, with with mesos uh, mesos is lovely i mean it, it's it, it just it, it basically handles resource allocation at uh, mesos itself and the scheduler puts your jobs where where it sees fit but just to to, to talk about the the mesos model a bit it, it really you know, takes your your virtual machines and turns them into globs of cpu disk and ram and so now like the the vms I, typically are going to be all consistent we don't really care about them we don't care we, we don't uh, launch a vm with a, a particular role we launch a, a vm with a, a mesos role and then we use a scheduler on top of mesos right now we're using aurora which you know, was developed in twitter we are we, we love it it's been just amazingly reliable uh, for us but the scheduler allows you to like, use the, the globs of, of resources that, that Mesos made for you, and it just slices them off. You know, if you, you, you tell it your, your job needs I don't know, point, uh, point 0.5 gigs of, of RAM and one CPU. Because you know it's a it's a hardcore non-threaded sequential process, and you want it to run fast. So so you you tell your scheduler 
uh, to launch this job with those resources, it asks Mesos to, uh, it basically carves uh, that, that amount of resources out and then creates a, a C groups a C groups container, uh, if you will, uh, to to launch your your job in, and so you can get all those benefits of a very high utilization. We actually have wonderful utilization with with Mesos because we're we're launching maybe a ton, maybe a, maybe a hundred jobs on a single VM, and because everybody built their jobs off of the same image, uh, which uh, that that VM is running. And we're using Mesos and the Aurora scheduler in order to slice off little pieces of that VM and, and launch the job within it. And so it's actually this wonderfully cost effective and, and also just incredibly convenient. Uh, so that like, Mesos and Aurora together give us beautiful orchestration that uh, the, the same kind of thing that you know, Kubernetes is going to give you with, uh, you know, with uh, the salt stack underpinnings. But yeah, we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely abstracted away from away from the VM. We just didn't need containers to, to get there. Hmm. What are the operational differences between somebody running a Kubernetes cluster with Docker containers and somebody running a big Mesos cluster where Mesos itself is just abstracting away the collection of VMs and allocating jobs that are across this uniform address space of Mesos stuff? Yeah, not much, not much really. I mean, it's, mm. uh, it's the different ways of getting at the same thing. Kubernetes will give you Docker. Mesos give you, gives you the option of having Docker. Okay, interesting. All right, well, let, let's, now that we've kind of covered the orchestration layer, let's, let's talk about data engineering, and then maybe we can get into the customer service stuff. But the data engineering, it really starts to get interesting because you've got all these data points that you can collect. You know, if people are buying health insurance, and then you can gather data points along their entire health journey, because every time they engage with a healthcare provider, you're getting feedback about that. What are some of the data points that you're able to collect on the data platform? Oh my goodness! Yeah, I tell you, our, our 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 general our general data space uh, is made up at the the very high level of the, well, there's there's members, there's the people, there's those those people can be either either members or they can be like healthcare professionals, providers. There is there's the plans, which are descriptions of the the plan configuration that the, the people have have signed up with. There's eligibility, which which turns out to be a complex space uh, because of uh, regulation, and that's that's just uh, determining uh, records to determine who is uh, eligible for to receive benefits under a plan at any uh, given point in time, and. Then there's uh, there's our claims, of course, and those come in as like uh, discrete uh, records that that describe that describe care that was that was that was provided or received, and there's authorizations that where people are requesting, you know, sending a, a pre authorization to say, hey, is this is this going to be okay, or are you going to are you going to cover this? All these things, and uh, we we also have agreements, uh, opt in agreements that we can. Uh, we can detect healthcare events, uh, like somebody gets checked into uh, an emergency room. We can actually get notified about that, so we can uh, do our best to to help uh, in, in some in some meaningful way if somebody needs it. Uh, so like, all all that all that gives you kind of a, a rough overview. There's yeah, there's there's tons more, but it's um, there's always so much to talk about in that space because there's there's so many so many problems inherent within it uh, to to solve. So. Mm. It's really it's 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 wonderful. Like uh, provider data is is one of those wonderful examples with uh, the project that you know at, at first glance might seem easy uh, if you haven't uh, haven't had to deal with it before. It's like you know what's the problem? You get the you get a, a, a bunch of data about providers. You uh, stick it in Solar Elasticsearch or something like that, and you search it. It's great. Uh, but yeah, the problem is that. Hit all of these data sources that are that are coming in. There's you know, the classic problems of missing data, incorrect data, just bad formats. Uh, just uh, and there, there's you know, duplicate, there's conflicting information. Yeah, it's all it's all just wonderful classic data pipeline stuff uh, where you have to you have to have a, a really big uh, kind of interesting pipeline to not only do the the, the records aggregation but to, to to do 
to, to do entity reconciliation, you know, deduping, splitting uh, different providers with the same name, that sort of thing. And yeah, this, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's really tough. And so it, well, we're going to have, as our membership grows, we're going to have exactly the same issues uh, with, with incoming member signups. So we're looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, claims coming in uh, need to be sometimes uh, corrected. There's, uh, the, there's, there's typos. You have to, uh, you have to uh, match the, uh, the, the incoming uh, provider in information to providers that are in our network. Because you know, if they're not in our network, then we don't have a, a negotiated fee schedule. We don't know what to pay, or we don't know whether we should uh, accept or deny the claim. And yeah, it's, uh, it, so it has to be this fuzzy matching uh, process. Uh, the same thing with member information. Yeah, this, is, this is stuff that people are just typing in, and all that stuff has to be has to be handled correctly by our systems. And you know, oftentimes in the in the insurance industry, that's actually handled you know, partially through uh, through technology, but with with people, with humans, like actually like entering that. So we're trying to get you know, we're just trying to get the the accuracy up to uh, to, to as much as uh, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So all this all this data is highly highly relational it's, it's it's sometimes hard to to decouple and to, to figure out like when member information is more clinical more you know, operational more it, it's 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 really wonderfully interpretive <laughs> at times and anyway lots of lots of really interesting data pipelining issues I'm not sure which part of that you you'd, you'd like to dive into more well let's start at the beginning so your first sure. two years at oscar you were focused on this full-time what was involved in setting up the data pipeline early on? It's not not much except you know just uh, parsing CSVs and trying to do it in a fairly coherent way. It's it's really wonderfully uh, it's a, it's a wonderful thing coming into to healthcare as a, as as a fairly seasoned you know, software engineer and and previous research scientist. It's a yeah, it's we came into the space with a with a bunch of kind of wide eyed ambitious people and started staring at the problem and you know wondering what we should start typing into our terminals. And it was just a wonderfully humbling experience because you know, none of us really knew what we were doing. Uh, we, this is we were all learning uh, for the first time. It's like yes, we know how to build data pipelines, we know how to set up databases, but we were all learning what this data meant and what the problems were going to be and how it all relates to each other and, and more so how can we leverage this to actually you know, make our let our, our, our customers have a, a good experience and or at, at the least to not contribute to a bad experience, uh, which is always just a horrible thing if you see it. And and so really a lot of that uh, a lot of the, the first the first couple of years was just really trying to trying to get our heads around it and trying to get as many of these feeds hooked up as quickly as possible because there are tons of them. Yeah, there's like yeah, seventy or eighty just uh, in, the, in the first half year that had to get you know, modeled, fed in. We had to set up the, the connectivity with, uh, with with various places, and so I, I'd say. Yeah, there, there wasn't a, a whole lot of thinking about how we're going to make some beautiful, you know, elegant uh, system. It was just you know get that data in and get it somewhere where it's going to be useful as as quick as possible. Like nowadays, we have that luxury of thinking about it's like ah, you know, you know, this is, this would benefit from a graph database or this would uh, benefit from. JSON B storage and Postgres. So now, now we can be sophisticated. Back then, back then it was a scramble. You know, so not only were we <laughs> ingesting all this data, we were we were doing everything else. It was involved with like making a making an actual insurance company that uh, that works, uh, which is which is a fairly fairly complex thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so that, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. So, so is that has stabilized? The product itself has stabilized. What has happened to the data pipeline? Oh uh, well, now you, you see wonderful things starting to happen. Like now we've, we were we're thinking in terms of like how what are the what are the characteristics that you want Could, to. Can you maybe like give me give me an idea of like data? You know, you've got lots of different data streams that could potentially come in. Yeah. Are they all hitting Kafka and then like getting fanned out to some different places? Or maybe you can walk me through oh, sure, the life sure. cycle of that data. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the properties of the storage engines that we're, that we're doing as well. So yeah, there's there's a, a pattern that's starting to emerge where a, you have to set up the perimeter connectivity in in some way. Oftentimes it's SFTP. Like SFTP is often like the the replacement for RPC or or, or REST in, in this in this industry. Like we we really like sending files to each other and. And those those files are in lots of various formats, and so we have sorry, to. Have sorry, some, not, not to interrupt you, but is that because like a hospital is sending you this SFTP stuff? 
It could be a hospital. It could be like a, a partner. It could be a provider network that's sending us mm-hmm. a, a roster of uh, of people who are currently in the network every every week, and we have to figure out the differences, that sort of thing. And pretty much everybody, it's a, the de facto way of, of of sending information, unless there's some very compelling reason that this has to be a, a synchronous process. And uh, that would be, say, a, a synchronous process might occur when you're when you're connecting with a, a remote uh, EHR, like an electronic health uh, system, and and then you like maybe you're doing a like a you're you're trying to let your member schedule a doctor's visit. That sort of thing has to be done uh, fairly synchronously. But the the de facto <laughs> the de facto way of communicating is over SFTP. The the whole insur- the whole industry is kind of enculturated into a calendar day information cycle. And so that's that's sort of that's sort of why, uh, you know, it's it's easy. It's we, we it's, it's it's robust. We know how to do it. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, it's great. So so we're kind of used to that. There's they'll, they'll send us things in, in various formats. I, I can talk about this for probably too long because I I love this stuff. But like there, there's this there's this thing EDI electronic data interchange. A wonderful wonderful thing. If you if you read the Wikipedia entry about this, you'll you know find out after after following a couple of links that it got its its start in like during the the Berlin airdrop. You know after after World War II, there is uh, this amazing logistical problem and getting supplies into to West Berlin you know, for the Allies, and they're using this. Uh, the, these like old uh, modems to to actually communicate. They need a compressed format to, to send it, and so this you know, this this thing has evolved over the decades. And really took hold in the in the, the health insurance um, in the industry, or the, the healthcare industry, I should say. So we have EDI. There's a, a U.S. dialect. There's European dialect of, of it. And of course, we we pretty much just deal with uh, the the U.S. thing. And it's this wonderful, wonderful protocol, which you can look. At, it's just a way of uh, transmitting structured data. But it's actually, I mean, you you need a you need a stack to understand it. It's a, a context sensitive grammar, and uh, when you, when you look at it, it's uh, it's it's really just amazing. And then developing uh, a parser, which we've done because you know we, we didn't just love all the ones that we, we found out there. Uh, developing a parser was one of the most fun things I've done yeah, in the last. I don't even know how long I can remember. Great, great stuff. Yeah, so. So there's uh, these these old formats. Uh, there's like HL7 is another one, which uh, less interesting. It's XML, and there's uh, we get lots of CSV like stuff, uh, just you know, stuff in various formats. We have to convert that into raw data, upload it to S3, stick it on, uh, stick an event on Kafka. That you know, you have a, a thing that uh, a subscriber might be interested in. Then you might you know, download the file, transform it in some way, stick it in a database. Have used MySQL. We're kind of moving more towards uh, Postgres as uh, as time goes on. I can talk about why in just a little bit. And 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 yeah, that's that's sort of how how this stuff goes. Mm. And yeah, you know, for in the in the opposite direction, it's it's pretty much exactly the same. You know, we have to communicate with people by uh, dropping things down in, some, in in whatever format they they need in an outgoing SFTP drop, or they they connect to us, they get it, and yeah, maybe we're going to send it to them over REST or, or SOAP, or, or maybe we just have to be prepared for just about anything. Spring is a season of growth and change. Have you been thinking you'd be happier at a new job? If you're dreaming about a new job and have been waiting for the right time to make a move, go to Hired.com slash SE Daily today. Hired makes finding work enjoyable. Hired uses an algorithmic job matching tool in combination with a talent advocate who will walk you through the process of finding a better job. Maybe you want more flexible hours, or more money, or remote work. Maybe you want to work at Zillow, or Squarespace, or Postmates, or some of the other top technology companies that are desperately looking for engineers on Hired. You and your skills are in high demand. You listen to a software engineering podcast in your spare time, so you're clearly passionate about technology. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. A $600 signing bonus from Hired when you find that great job that gives you the respect and the salary that you deserve as a talented engineer. I love Hired because it puts you in charge. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily 
And thanks to Hired for being a continued, long-running sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. So you're talking about a lot of ways that data can come in. Once mm-hmm. it's into the system, what are you doing to extract value from it? You could deliver it to data scientists. You could somehow integrate it back into the customer service platform. You could integrate it into the customer-facing application. What are the different things that you can do with that mass of data once it is ingested and indexed and normalized? I mean, just uh, unifying it and presenting a cohesive view that's uh, deduplicated is, is really you know, kind of the kind of the dream. Yeah, just so that you uh, developing developing the truth is uh, is actually quite challenging. We've got missing information or like incorrect information uh, coming in, and and also when you have. A, we, we can we can transform things in such a way that you know business decisions are made based on data that was that was buggy. What do we do about that? And so, they actually. Like constructing a, a storage layer that uh, lets us have that kind of unification, the kind of flexibility, but also lets us like really have a, a very tight understanding of, of data over time is is really kind of the the first step. I'd say you know you could look at this as being a, a nascent effort at, at Oscar, but you you see a lot more of our of our stuff ending up in you know what we call I guess that's a standard term a bitemporal a bitemporal storage. And you know what we mean by that is that we you know, we store things you know, generally as relational it doesn't have to be but you know, we store it with uh, with with two different dimensions of of time you know there's the the valid time which is just when was a particular assertion true and you know, if it's unbounded maybe it was true from today till the end of time or maybe it was just true maybe we're talking about a membership uh, or a member's eligibility span and then then it has a an end date you know this was true from you know January 15th to you know March 1st when they called in and canceled i don't know and and so we we have those those validity periods which can't be overlapping for a single assertion because that would be a, a, a conflict and but then we also the, the second dimension of time is the transaction time and that's 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 basically you know, what what did the the system think was true at a given point in time which can be a, you can get a very different answer from what what was true uh, at the at a given time and that would be say for for a bug you know let's say we we improperly canceled somebody's uh, membership on on March 1st and then retroactively a week later we instated that uh, we reinstated the the plan so you know the validity period was at one point you know was, was at one point say January 1st to unbounded then it got truncated to January 1st to uh, to March 1st and then it got retroactively corrected to January 1st to unbounded again Oh, well, there's that week of time where we made it might have made business decisions, and it's incredibly helpful to be able to go back to that week and say, "Hey, what did the system think was true on you know, on on March second, and what what happened?" Like going back to to try to, try to understand some of the decisions that were made, some of the you know, the, the payment decisions or the the care decisions. So we can now go back and understand. Ah, you know, that's because. We had the wrong data, and now we can like rerun these events using the the validity period rather than the, the transaction period. Wonderfully useful. Now we developed that first for uh, just for thinking about our our new claims engine, which is actually a wonderful thing to talk about. But I don't know if we'll have time. <laughs> but but the, this I, this idea that we were going to need these these two different dimensions kept on popping up. So once we started talking mm-hmm. about it with the claims, like ah, we, we talked to other teams, and like yeah, that uh, totally makes sense for for member data, and for you know, plans, signups, like all this. All the, and so so now we're like, all right, you know, let, let's just make everything in general bitemporal. That that's the kind of this uh, this layer of, of of integrated truth that we're trying to we're uh, getting a. Um, Getting really nicely transformed data, a really nice have approach to time in that data, and make sure that all the relationships are covered. And you know, that's that's sort of the goal with the with the data engineering piece right now is like developing that foundation. Like on top of that foundation, many many things can be built. Like the 
Yeah, you are, and that's you know, that, that's that's next. You can see some of the like predictive learning, statistical learning coming out of you know, all these um, all these relationships. But right now, just building that really solid foundation, getting our operations tight, is is really the focus of our of our data engineering work. Well, let's start to move towards that conversation. So, what are the moonshot goals that Oscar could accomplish in the next five or ten years once this data is closely integrated with customer facing products sure well you can uh, you could just imagine you know, say you know, making a making a, an appointment through the Oscar web apps with a with a doctor and uh, you then walk into the into a doctor's office. You have geofencing, and so you get automatically signed in. Transfer your uh, personal, your demographic uh, information. Uh, fill out all those forms. Kind of automatically, you can look over them, sign them uh, manually, but you don't have to do that work. It's you know, still a matter of convenience. And we could make a, your your electronic health records uh, with your consent available to the doctors so that they they understand your what you're you're coming in with your context. The doctor could uh, the, the receptionist even before you're before you're seeing the doctor can you know, just do a, a quick check, make sure that you're eligible. You know, nothing new there. That's great. But you know, you're coming in for a particular reason, and we might need to do these tests. All right. So let's uh, let's see. Are those things going to be covered? We should be able to, like, not only I like, tell you these things covered, but we should be able to tell you exactly uh, what your copay is going to be and you know, how this is. Is this going to work towards your deductible? Has your deductible already been met? You know, what's uh, what's going to be the exact payment situation? Hopefully, you'd be able to make a decision before you actually get the service. They are exposing those uh, those costs up front in very precise ways it would be really amazing. Then, let's say you get the care. And you're you're walking out of the office, so you know, why not at, at that point you know, just um, you know, have the, the doctor submit the the claim right right there and then. And if, if they can do that, we've taken a, a couple of hops of, of extra inefficiency out of the system. But also, you know, we could if, if we're going to owe the the, the provider, yeah, why not just pay them right then? So you know, if uh, if if you want the money in your bank account you know, tomorrow, then you know, submit your claim today. And that whole integrated experience would cut so much confusion out of the, the process and so much inefficiency out, out of the process. And you see, it's not just then that we're, we're providing a convenient case, a convenient experience for the member. We're also providing convenient experience for, for the provider. We want to be mindful of both of those relationships being very important and doing what we can to broker those, uh, not only those individual relationships with us, but the relationship between the member and the, and the provider. And so just as a, a member experience, you know, that's more, that, that would be a kind of a, kind of a moonshot. The kind of technology that we need to, to build all of that doesn't really exist in the space right now, but that's what we're, that's what we're creating. And so we're we're expecting some uh, some really exciting stuff to to come out once we've like, finally like, done the work of of building all of the the basic infrastructure and applications that that we need to to construct an insurance company. Yeah, you know, we've we've had to we've had to outsource certain parts of it uh, just because it's it's not possible to build a fully running uh, insurance company in just a few months or even even a couple of years. But we keep on insourcing and housing more and more of it as, as time goes on. And yeah, we're looking at, uh, at replacing some, some pretty major pieces like our, our internal claims engine, our billing and payment systems have already been done, our eligibility engine. Like all, all these are, are the stuff, like that, those are the, like on top of that integrated data platform, we had the inter- integrated logic platform to make some of these really beautiful customer experiences um, become a, a reality. That's, uh, that's what we're shooting for. That's one thing that's cool about the opportunities in what I sometimes hear being called digital health, rather than when people think, because when people think about like, oh, what's the in- in- intersection of healthcare and technology, people think about like a, a new robotics that's going to do surgery on you. And it's like, you don't even need that necessarily. You just need computers doing what they do well, and you can get a vastly more efficient system. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, you can see that happening. Uh, just uh, stepping back from, from Oscar a little bit. Yeah. That's uh 
It's, it's wonderful to see the kind of focus that, that I'm perceiving now in, in venture capital and also just what uh, what entrepreneurs are, are really interested in, in, in tackling right now. Is it getting as- easier? Is it getting easier for an entrepreneur that wants to build a business in healthcare? Oh, in, in healthcare, it's, it's still pretty tough. I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. A health insurance company is not going to be easy, just period. It's, it's just really hard <laughs> because not, not only because of uh, how much work you need to do and uh, how much uh, competency you need to, to acquire from very early on, but the, like the, the regulatory engagement that you need before getting out the door, the kind of cash that you have to have in the bank uh, to, to cover things if they go sideways, um, it's, a, it's a huge moat to cross. Hey, we were the the first uh, the first new insurer in in New York in uh, 15 17 years something like that it's just not something that happens very often because it's super hard why was Oscar able to do that when nobody else could do it for 15 or 17 years well we we have some pretty awesome uh, co-founders they're well connected they're smart they're experienced and they they were able to pull a lot of this together but really and, and, and ambitious. I mean, they right. they're they're kind of crazy no, to, to pull. There pull was no off. one one weird trick to build an insurance no. company. Which they just no, like no. worked well, really hard. Yeah. So I mean, we we also benefited from the Affordable Care Act. And so we, we had that that wonderful conflagration of having of having a promise of a real shakeup, or at least the indication that there might be a big disruptive legal legislative happening. And you know, if we could position a company to take advantage of that, well, that gets uh, that gets venture capital interested and then mm-hmm. you had to have a, a bunch of, of, of crazy co-founders to think that you know you it's like wow let's, let's do let's make a health insurance company and let's try to fix something as as ingrained and difficult as the, the United States health insurance or just healthcare industry and you know, I had to find people who were crazy enough to, to think that it was a good idea to help them mm-hmm. so yeah it's uh, I mean it's it's just um, it's tough, and you know, the, the Affordable Care Act really, really did get us the the investment interests. But then, like the the ambition and the and the, the competency of the, of the the people who really got this place started is, yeah, it's, it's something that I find I, I find pretty impressive. Okay, so last question in the remaining five minutes or so we have: Why is it that the United States healthcare system is so much more expensive and less efficient than the other developed nations like Singapore or Israel? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to just put my opinion hat on here, but yeah, I, I think it's an opinion that's that, that's shared by, you know, by by many of us here. But I think that the getting back to the, the set of relationships uh, that I was talking about just at the, the very beginning, you know, that really is the the source of a lot of this expense because we we have absolutely the wrong relationships to like, create a, a viable market and to put healthy market pressure on the the right players in the right ways and just getting back to the initial customer relationship with the with the healthcare and with the, the health insurer the insurer is selling to the employer and so the the employer is is now the source of of money. Uh, they're the customer. They're your friend. The uh, the the person who's engaging with healthcare is a cost driver. You know, you're going to try to minimize the the amount of costs that they develop in the in the old model. <laughs> and and also probably even more diabolical, you have the people who are actually engaging with healthcare are completely cut out of of the the pricing of it. So you you basically in, in America, you just want your health insurance to, to cover your expenses. You don't have to, to look at it. If you've ever looked at one of those explanation of benefits uh, letters after you've been to the, the hospital, they're they're crazy. You see things like, you know, you had had these like incomprehensible services done to you, builds, I don't know, 5000 like uh, the insurance company approved $400 uh, paid 300 UO 100 something like that. And it's like, well, okay, cool. And... Yes, but but why why this? And you know, did I get a, a chance to shop around? Like, no. Even if you have the luxury of choosing which hospital you're about to go to, you're not going to be able to, to easily get the the, the prices the, uh, up front. Now, 
you know, if you're actually paying, you, you might start thinking about that a little bit more. You know, then it's like, ah, oh, so uh, you know, I have this, this hospital, you know, hospital A versus hospital B. You know, in the old world, it's like, well, you know, I, I have this, this vague idea that hospital A is kind of higher quality than hospital B, which may or may not be the case. But you don't know. It's completely abstracted away from you. The hospital A is actually four times the cost of, of hospital B, and it's not four times the quality. And so if you actually have to pay out of your own pocket, you might go to hospital B. That whole decision, that, that whole market pressure is absolutely cut out of the, the equation. Uh, so that's one of the things that you know, we're hoping uh, to, to really take advantage of those, those new relationships to help basically put the right kind of market pressures back on and have this uh, get, the, get the actual customer as much back into, into the conversation the way that they should be as market participants. Hmm. Isaac, I want to thank you for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been a great conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver this content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow!